Good afternoon and welcome to the Carolina Codecast, the official podcast of the Carolina Code Conference. With me today is Don Sullivan. Say hello, Don. Hello, everyone. Glad to have you with us. So, Don, uh, Good to be here. T- tell us about yourself a little bit. What are you doing these days? Where are you working? Where are you living? Well, I'm living in Linden, Washington. It's a small town, about 15,000 people. It's just north of the Canadian border. I'm I'm like three miles from Canada this way. So leave out of my house, okay. walk north. I'm in Canada. Um, I've been here for hey, almost eight years now. Um, right now, I'm working as a senior software engineer at Simply Binary. Uh, been there since June 6th of 2022. So, okay, enjoying it. Yeah, good, uh, good time. So, what type of work are you doing over with Simply Binary? So, I have been doing software engineering projects. I, I actually started life as a Ruby developer, and uh, yeah, I've been fortunate with Simply Binary to be able to get involved in like numerous different coding languages. I've been involved in writing some Go, uh, written some Elixir, uh, C Sharp. Yeah, nice. it's been really fun to be able to jump in on these projects and. I, th- I think for the longest time, there was a part of me that felt like you're an imposter because you basically learned Ruby on Rails on the 15 minute tutorial. And you've basically worked on that 15 minute tutorial for eight years now, Don, you know, or X number of years. I, you know, so it was, it was good to be able to get a, an ability to kind of test the words and be like, okay, can I do something other than Rails development? Yes, I can. That's great. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely been enjoyable. Yeah, I can, I, I could. Can- Definitely understand because you had a bit of a different path into programming in general, didn't you? I had an extremely different path into programming. Um, well, while you. the rest of you, oh uh, yeah, while the rest of you guys at Clemson were taking your lives seriously, I was taking my lives like you know, I was taking my life significantly less seriously. Um, you were taking serious mm-hmm. things. I was taking psychology. <laughs> And at some point, I knew I was going to have to have a job, but I didn't let that stop me at that point. So I got out of college, and I'd been working in retail forever. Um, I was working at Sherwin Williams, I worked at Office Max, Comp USA, Bed Bath and Beyond. I bounced around to a lot of different places, and uh, the recession hit in two thousand eight, and I was working at Office Max at the time, and I lost my job. And my wife came to me at the time, sweet woman. She said, hey, what would you be doing with your life if you could do anything else? And I was like, you know, I think I want to be a computer programmer. And so she took the next few months. She had been a stay-at-home mom. And we just recently had our our now 16-year-old daughter. Um, She's about six months old at the time when this happened. And uh, so while I was out of work, she worked at Starbucks just to keep you know, the bills being paid and I started teaching myself software development and web design. And it was really, it was, it was, it was fun, but it was really stressful. I mean, obviously like you're out of work, you're the guy, you're the the alpha breadwinner. And here you are like, you're doing nothing other than doing tutorials online. I got an offer for a job from the Christian Research Institute. It was a ministry position, but they're looking for a webmaster. And I, I thought it was because of my, you know, not just being a developer, but I'm also into apologetics and all these things. I felt like, you know, I asked my boss one time if that was why they oh, hired cool. me. He started laughing. Hmm. I said, oh, I asked really my cool. boss. Oh, okay, okay. I asked my boss if that was why they hired me. We've like, got a little bit of a lag going here. I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, I know, that's okay. I, I saw it too. So I asked my boss, I'm like, so did you guys hire me because of like this this dual threat capability? He's like, no, we hired you because you were like half the price of every other developer because you're just starting out. So <laughs> <laughs> that kind of honesty See, was. This uh, is, this is going to take me back to the original advice I give to everybody is take the first job no matter what they pay you. You just care that's about exactly the experience. right. <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly it. I stayed there for three years and it was I was I actually was making less working for them than I was making in retail management. And that was really stressful for a while. And I got my first job with the Department of State after that that was like a I want to say it was like I, I got the job based on my ability to do the job that I was doing. That was probably one of the more exciting moments of my life. 
I and from there yes. we you know have just I've, I've steadily gotten different positions got yeah, figured out more about what i like out of life and what i'm wanting and kind of have really hit a sweet spot now so but that was like a 15 16 year process to get here that's that's quite a journey now it, it doesn't surprise me that you were able to get into programming quickly um and it doesn't surprise me that you chose to go into programming because for those of you listening, uh, Don and I have known each other since college, as he as he alluded to earlier. And Don was a genius psychology student uh, who who coasted through with a four uh, and, uh, and I was was in computer information systems at the time. And Don and I had a habit of finding each other at parties and trying to figure out if we could come up with actual AI back in 2000. Like, what would it take to design a system that could learn like an actual human baby learns from the time that it's born? And this is this is what we were doing in college in our spare time while, while we were at these different events. But a beer <laughs> helps. Um, yeah. It, it did. Well, that, that definitely smooths the thought process at times. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, the interest had always been there. And, and I'd always been interested in psychology also. I almost minored in psychology. I don't know if I ever told you that. Um, you did, actually. That's pretty cool. I, I took a psych 101 course and found out I was going to have to do another 18 hours for the classes in order to minor in psychology. So I was like, ah, never mind. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, that first intro class, like the rest of the degree is like just – 36 more hours of that really <laughs> so didn't miss out. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll never forget. I had the greatest uh, name for a professor for my one-on-one psychology class. His name was literally Brainerd brain nerd. I knew you were going to say that. I knew it was going to be Dr. Brainerd. I knew it was going to be Brainerd. <laughs> he was awesome. He was a good guy. Um, it, it's funny. I had, I don't know if I ever told you this. I actually had five majors the first two years of college. I, I chose psychology five? because I five, yeah, because I kept. I would take one, and I'd start taking the classes, and I'd realize I hated the classes, and so it was like I, I was I was a history major at first, and then I had gotten an Air Force ROTC scholarship, and they told me, "Well, you have to do something that's like real, not history." I'm like, "Okay, well, I'll do math." <laughs> so in first math class, I'm like, "I hate math. Why did I do this?" And so I, I got out of that and I got out of the, the whole Air Force thing because I was like, you guys want me to do like really serious. I, I'm, really, I'm not really equipped for this. So <laughs> I went to language and international trade for like a whole semester. That was awful. I did philosophy okay. for like – philosophy was probably one that was actually my spirit animal. But I just, you know, again, I needed to eat when I was done. And so finally I mean, what, went to philosophy psychology. Philosophy is a lot of logic. I mean, that, that makes it sense. Is. I could definitely see. You it is. That. It wasn't the worst choice. It was just a matter of like, okay, I don't know if there's any practical applications. And I, I had a psychology class that I had to take as one of my general, like my gen ed classes. And it's the only class I went to that semester that I went to every class. And I was like, well, that's really amazing. And it, they also didn't require attendance. So the teacher didn't have like a, if I went to every class and there was not a required attendance policy, there, it must have been a great class. Because my typical yeah. modus operandi was find out how many classes I could not be there for and not be there for every one of the classes <laughs> I could not be there for. If you had no attendance policy, you would typically see me on test day and that would be it. So I was I was really astounded that I went to every class and that's when I changed my major. Yeah, I, but I, I going back into this, the, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying, like, it, it's, yeah, I, it, it was really hard for me to figure out something I could apply my my degree to, obviously. So I went back and ended up getting a master's degree, even in human resource development. I still wasn't really using it. I, my mom kept telling me, she's like, you know, I don't know why you didn't go into computer engineering. And I'm thinking part of it is like, maybe because you kept telling me I should go into computer engineering. You know, that's is, that is like reverse psychology in general. <laughs> if you want me to do something, don't tell me to do it. That's usually the typical way to make sure I don't do. Something. So yeah, I, I finally gave in. I was like, okay, mom, you're right. <laughs> and here we are. 
that uh that that is quite a journey into it i never i never had any idea about all the other uh about all the other majors that you tried out oh um, yeah i tried everything the, uh, what was it I, I wasn't i wasn't quite where you were in terms of the um figuring out the attendance policy stuff on classes but what I did do every semester is I knew what the very last day that you could drop a class was without it counting against you, without it like taking away your your late drop <laughs> credits because you know there was, yes. you only, you only had a certain amount of credits that you could use for absolute late drops. And so what I would do every single semester was I would sign up for a full load of classes, and then whatever, and then I'd go to my classes, and if I found that any teachers were going to be giving an absurd amount of busy work homework assignments. Or if there was just some issue with the way that the class was set up, but I was like, this is never going, they think this is the only class I have, like one of those types, I would just drop it. Yep. And then I would focus on, on doing well in the rest of the classes. Absolutely. And it worked out well for me. Whenever I told my wife that, she, she got so mad at me. She's like, what? I cannot believe you did that. But, but it worked out all right. I can't believe you wouldn't do that. Like, <laughs> to me, that's just really sound. <laughs> I remember I knew I had exactly. a problem when was, I walked into an econ. That was before I knew about the Rate Your Professor website, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I knew I had a problem when I walked into econ my sophomore year, and Anthony Simmons looks at me. He's like, dude, I thought you dropped this class. And I was like, no, I'm still in it. He's like, well, where have you been for like the past two months? I'm like, well, it's not a required attendance. <laughs> I want to be here. <laughs> Oh, well, I can I can definitely say from experience that, you know, quite a bit about uh, about economics. So I think that was probably well judged. But um, goodness gracious. All right. So I, I guess I need to go ahead and warn the audience one more time. This might get a little strange just because Don and I have known each other for so long. We um, we reconnected uh, recently when Don was in town uh, a couple months back. And uh, he was in town visiting with the, the Simply Binary folks, you know, at, at a uh, kind of a get together there. He had some family in North Carolina and we all got together uh, at Heart Attack Central Spartanburg, the Beacon. And uh, if you've never been to the Beacon, uh, it is it is a life changing experience. If you go more than once a year or life ending experience. Yep. And, uh, and so we went and we got the, the giant O plenty plates piled high with, with onion rings and everything. And, and, uh, we were having such a good time to share in old stories and everything at the, at the, the table with old simply binary folks. We were like, you know what? You got to come on this podcast. We got to, we got to do this and make this happen. <laughs> so, it's good. So to here be we are. That's how we here. Yeah. And so, you know, you know some, I, I typically give this warning, uh, to people ahead of the podcast, but I felt for our listeners sake, uh, I would give this warning on the podcast this time. We're not live streaming this, so I can edit stuff out if I have to. Uh, and so if there are gaps in this for, if, if you're listening, there's a reason and it might be worth a story another time in person, but it can't be broadcast. I assure you that. Yeah, there's stories that we can't really post. <laughs> Online. Yep. So, uh, how did you enjoy the? Uh, how did you enjoy the beacon after you know Washington? <sighs> you know, it was it was my equivalent of being like a forty five year old guy who like jumps back into playing basketball or something after being away for twenty years. It just <laughs> felt like I was back in my element, like the grease dripping down the walls. The it's it's hard because living in the Northwest, <laughs> there's like an unspoken you don't eat at places like that. Like if you do, you're one of those kind of people, oh. and it's just like. I feel like it should be okay, but <laughs> the people around me don't. It's just really hard to find a decent greasy spoon. Now, I'm fortunate. My hometown here is almost like someone like dug up a nondescript town in South Carolina and transported it across the country and dropped it over here in Washington. And that has been a real blessing. Like We've, we've discussed that quite a bit. Nice. It's, it's nice. But there is still – it's 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 – left you know the west coast there's there's a fitness aesthetic that says hey don't eat like that so it's fun to come home i i, I made a big deal when we were home i was like how many places are we going to go what are we going to eat how badly am i going to eat and yeah you know, it's funny because justin asked if they were eating he's like you had like a death march for you or something like, are you just like trying to kill yourself i'm like no and yes <laughs> 
It's it's not an intentional, I'm going to kill myself. It is a very intentional, all the things I don't get to eat, I'm going to eat every one of them while I'm here. So if it happens, yep. it happens. But it was great. My son, my oldest son, took me to an all-you-can-eat sushi buffet there in, in Monroe, North Carolina. And we just really just went ridiculous with it. And then I found out there's a, an all-you-can-eat Mexican buffet in Lancaster, South Carolina. So I went there what? and it was now I'm telling you, for $12, you, you owe it to the fam to jump in the car. It's just down Highway 9. If you can find Highway 9, which I know you can, take 9 That's across right. to Lancaster and look for La Chalupa. La Chalupa. All La right. Chalupa. $12 a like person, all you can eat. Up. Yeah, and it's not, it it's not a, a... A family trip, that might be a, <laughs> a, a trip. Personal that, discovery. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. You know, now it's, it's safe for me themselves. to do something like that now because I've got the Tesla and I can just let it drive me home if I pass out from the food. So that's good. That's good because you might. I mean, that, that buffet was loaded and it wasn't one of those. There are certain places where you can go and the food is just amazing. This was not one of those things. It's really more of just there's that much Mexican food in one place. So I can eat all that I want to. Oh, yes. OK, I'll take this. So, All right. So while we're on Mexican food, I'm going to segue into this a little bit. Uh, you are a taco enthusiast. And you mildly. and your family did something that made me so jealous. And I, I really want to hear more about it. You took an entire trip around the country while working remote with like a pulling a camper behind your car or something, I'll let you get into the absolute details. That's exactly uh, right. As a so, software developer, with the intention of having a taco in every single state. So I'm happened. gonna shut up and let you tell this story. <laughs> it's like my wife and I have always been big travel enthusiasts, and we thought it would happen one day when we were like old and the kids were out of the house. And my oldest son was getting married during COVID. And his wife is in North Carolina. And we were like, I'm not flying on an airplane. And then, you know, beyond anything, it's just like, I don't care what your views are. I don't want to be trapped in a box with a bunch of people that might be sick. So yeah. while they were flying out to, to go there, I said, you know, we've always wanted to travel. Babe, let's get a travel trailer. So we bought a travel trailer just out of nowhere. It was one October. It was October of 2020. And it was just the strangest set of impulse buys I've ever made in my entire life. I do think we bought a trailer, totally impulse. And I was like, you know, we're going to pull this with our, we had a Honda Odyssey at the time. So we're going to pull this with the Honda Odyssey. I know it's going to work. I had the tow packs put on it. Well, my father-in-law was hanging out with us one day and he's like, he's one of those guys that used to know he has like all of the knowledge about the towing and the trucks and all the things like just that kind of like, man knowledge it may have been lost to our generation i don't think we're that good at it but he's just had this this thing in the back of his head like you'll never be able to do that because then you know, it gives me this list of reasons why it's not going to work and so he's doing this we're leaving on december 11th and he's doing this on december 7th and i'm sitting there I'm like babe oh, i feel like i've made a monumentally stupid decision that i can't recover from and she's like well just you know keep a look out so you know, we, we said our prayers trying to figure out like, what are we looking for? And, you know, we found a truck that was exactly the right one. I mean, just exact, like down to having sunroof in the top of it. I'm like, okay, I called the dealership and he's like the, my, my sales guy's like, do you want to, to come look at it? I'm like, I don't want to look at it. I want to buy it. I want it right now. Can I come get it on Monday? So we went and got it on that Monday. We're leaving to go out of town on Thursday. I got the truck on Monday. So I had no idea how any of this stuff worked. This is as fly by the seat of the pants as you can possibly be. We bought the trailer in Michigan. So we had to drive all the way from Linden to Detroit to pick up the trailer. And then we were, we hit the road. So yeah, it was, it was a really neat experience to be able to spend three months on the road and work and eat and just, just have all these great experiences. we, the, the experiences starting out were kind of bad. My son calls me after we had gotten together. And he calls me on Christmas Eve, I think, or the, the day before Christmas Eve. He says, hey, um, we tested positive for COVID. I'm like, are you seeing, dude, what time did you test positive for COVID? Did you test positive for it, like, after you hung out with us all afternoon? Oh, yeah, that was when, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, 
So now we can't hang out with my family because I want to get them sick. We cooked for, for Christmas dinner that year. It was 20 degrees at Andrew Jackson State Park for Christmas where we're set up. So we're freezing to death in this trailer. We had no sewage. I was afraid to run the water. So we're sitting here trying to roast this duck oh, in the oven of the trailer to have Christmas dinner. So, you know, we were kind of like, you know, as bad as this wow. food experience is, it can't get much worse. So we hit the road after, after the wedding was over. We hit the road. Are pretty thin. Oh, they're extremely thin. And it was 20, like, I have never been that cold in my entire life. Like, there was no getting warm. It was unbelievable. And and I was just, you know, we were frustrated because we couldn't really leave because we were there for Brody's wedding. And thankfully, Dee's brother, who's also an avid traveler, calls us. He's like, you have a thousand trail membership, right? We're like, yeah. He's like, what are you fools doing in South Carolina? Go to Florida for the week. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. So we ended up going to Florida for the week to kind of wait it out. And that kind of started the whole, let's just see how many places we can eat and go and experience while we're on the way back. So we hit, if it was a food area, we did our best to just really hit and experience it. So New Orleans was a, a, that was a fabulous week we spent there just eating and working, eating and working. I I may have eaten probably 10 pounds of crawdads. It was great. Cool. yeah, a funny story. Like we called and, you know, I was trying to get crawdads. I finally found a convenience store in the middle of the French quarter. They just happened to have crawdads and I was buying them by the bag from them just because I just needed them. And we got them. We're taking them back to our campground and we're so excited about having the crawdads. We're like, but we don't have anything to serve with them. So we actually had to stop at another restaurant to eat seafood that night. And just keep the crowd as with us so we can eat them tomorrow for the next meal. <laughs> so this was New Orleans is a food <laughs> fun paradise. It was ridiculous. I had this oh, this I, I would definitely recommend if you're ever in New Orleans and you go somewhere and they say they have a muffaletta, you owe it to yourself to try one just to see if you can eat the muffaletta. Well, what is it? Oh, the muffaletta. Okay, so the muffaletta is a ginormous sandwich. The best way to explain it, it's it's the size of a full, probably hubcap would be my guess. That's the closest size comparison <laughs> I can make. I we went it. It's unreal, and it's topped with just. It's almost like someone somewhere said, "I wonder how many things I can put on this sandwich and still close the top of the sandwich." So. I ordered a seafood from Vasquez's Seafood in Covington, Louisiana. I had a muffaletta that was packed with shrimp, scallops, mussels. Uh, I want to say there was some chicken spread in it. It was just unreal. And I remember the guy asking me when I ordered it. He's like, do you want the half muffaletta or the whole muffaletta? I'm like, well, how big is the whole? And he says, I just want you to know you should probably choose the half. I'm like, okay, I'll have the half. This thing comes out. And at first I was kind of like blown away by the size of this sandwich. I'm like, if this is half, I kind of want the whole. <laughs> and so I made it through it and I felt so ripped off because I kind I think I could have probably finished that up. It was just, it was just unbelievable. The, the flavors, the, the everything. So, you know, we had, Great food there. We went through Texas and did enough beef brisket to choke a horse. We we a big thing for us is finding the food trucks wherever we go. We're I'm a food truck addict. So yeah, tacos are a big thing. Um but food trucks in general. So what created the food truck addiction? I think there's there's a there's an ethos about the food truck that says this is what I would make sitting at my house as a person who lives here. If I didn't run a business, this is the way I would make tacos for my family. This is the, this is the kind of cool sandwich. We stopped at a a food truck in San Antonio. The guy made this grilled cheese cheeseburger and it was just a Mm. cheeseburger. It was, it was a burger patty with cheese on top of it. They had been slammed between two grilled cheese sandwiches. And at first there was a lunacy about it. But then there's like, wait a second. I think I'd like to try that. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you're going wait, to the food truck twice. Wait, wait, wait. Back up. Back up. 
let me make sure I, I heard you correctly here. Because mm-hmm. when you said a grilled cheese cheeseburger, my first thought was, oh, like a patty melt. So it would be that was mine too. Bread, bread, burger, cheese, bread. But you had a full grilled cheese sandwich. You're then thinking, a patty. Yeah, you're then thinking another too whole limitedly. grilled cheese sandwich. Yes. That is the grilled cheese cheeseburger. Oh it was two grilled cheeses with a burger in between it. It was unbelievable. People are geniuses. Yeah, I mean, it was unreal. And they had these... That's uh, innovation. Right there. Those guys made these shrimp tacos that had this like... Uh, it's almost like the um, the yum yum sauce that comes with uh, like a Japanese hibachi meal. Just yeah. covering the taco. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. We hit that food truck over and over. And it was like 40 minutes away from our campground, but we refused to let that taco truck die. We kept going there. But, uh, you know, so we did that. Um, New Mexico we went through there. Um, Arizona, we went through Southern Arizona. California was probably one of the best food places I ate, I could, could possibly find. I mean, we had such an, uh, such an incredible variety of places there uh, there was a stop in El Cajon that was uh, Middle Eastern shawarma. they did shawarma and that's all they did and it was just unbelievably good and it's just it's really awesome to be able to go out to these different places because you go to these food trucks these people are really proud of the work that they put into their food it's their livelihood it's their lifestyle it's 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 said like it's it's their signature and just the kind of people that you end up meeting there, like we had some really neat experiences. Like the the truck in particular in San Diego is called Yum Yummy. I don't even think it's open now, or I should say El Cajon. But you know, we went there on our first. This this is twenty twenty two when we went there. We do this every year, but we're not doing it this year because we're tired and burned out from it. But we went out in twenty twenty two, went to this place, and we stopped there on the way. Because we were going all the way to air to New Mexico, we stopped there on the way to New Mexico. And we stopped on the way back, and the guys remembered us and asked us how the trip was. So it's just kind of like you know, the 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 experiences you have in that, like you know, they were the, the they were really wanting us to be able to experience some of their food. So they gave me this drink that was made of uh, yogurt and garlic and mint, and that was really an unexpected thing when somebody hands you a drink and it tastes like garlic and mint and yogurt and you're like i'm not really sure what to expect out of this because i feel like i should dip something in it but you're handing it to me to drink huh and what was weird is that was actually really good (laughs) i'm trying to imagine that flavor that flavor and i'm I'm having a hard time putting that one together take take tzatziki sauce and remove the cucumbers from it and that was essentially what this drink was so it was really like i was drinking the ziki sauce that actually makes sense we, we, we keep I that mean, stuff around the house all the time. Really good on salads. Oh yeah, I, the, I was just, it was just really cool. To like, see, be able to see that culture and like to experience like something that's not like I went to a drive-through and got this box of Popeyes chicken or I door dashed, you know, an order of McDonald's. Here. Yay! So, all right, it's yeah. I know you're West Coast right now. So Mm -hmm. you're probably not getting nearly as hungry as I am listening to this conversation. Uh, But, you know, as we're recording, it's getting late in the day over here for me and and I'm approaching dinner time and I'm getting really, really hungry. So I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Um, During your giant round trip around the country while eating all this Mm -hmm. incredible food, Mm -hmm. um, what were some non food related stories? From your big, uh, from your big oh, trip, what, th- what type of stuff did y'all do? What were some favorite stops in the states? So many. So you know, one of the coolest things for me, I, I really love the national parks, and so anytime we can fit some national park visits in somewhere, it's it's always a good trip for me. So we've we've hit, I think over the past three years, we've managed to fit in about twenty five national parks, and it, it's nice. just it's. Ah, oh, yeah, it's so incredible to, to just, you know, be able to, to experience nature the way you know, I feel like we were intended to be able to experience it. And, you know, the things we've seen, like, just things that bring you to tears, man. Like, walking through Arches National Park has got to be one of the most surreal experiences ever. Like, as these giant, where is that? you know, three, four, it's in Utah. So it's right outside of Moab, Utah. 
there's a lot of great food trucks in Moab too. So, <laughs> and we hit all of them. Um, the, the, the cool thing with, with the national parks though, is you're able to get out of our, our normal routine. And I think that's one of the things I love about working on the road. There's a yearning there every time we're not on the road, there's yearning to get back on the road because you actually get to experience something that's not just your average. I'm living in a 2000 or 3000 square foot box. I have my set list of things to do. There is an adventurousness that comes over that, you know, we don't normally have a perfect example. We went to Canyonlands national park and I'll say may we went on, on Memorial day actually this year, we've been planning the trip for a long time. So this year we went, we did a, uh, 12 state, 14 national park tour over the, the winter time. I don't want to say winter. We actually left in, in April of 2023 and went traveling. But so anyway, we're, we're in arches national park and Canyon lands. They're both in the same location. Really They're about 45 miles from each other. Our pastor at church had been to arches. And so I was asking him like, Hey, what, what do you think we should do? And so he gave us the rundown of what we should be doing. So I asked him about Canyon lands and he said, well, you know, Canyonlands is fun, but there's not a whole lot to do. So you're better off spending two days at Arches. So we spent our two days at Arches and we still had a third day left. I was like, well, I'm going to Canyonlands because I just want to like, cry, you know, if nothing else, cross off the list. I, I'm a, I'm a list crosser at heart. Like if I, it's, it's, if I have something where I can check a button or click something, I, I'm all for it. So I'm going to click this thing off the button, off the bucket list. So we go to Canyonlands okay. and I found out about the Schaefer Canyon Rim Drive. And the article that I had read said it was lots of fun for the whole family. And I thought, well, fun for the family sounds really good. And it's thrilling. It's thrilling fun for the whole family. I am all for thrilling fun for the whole family. I should have read more, but I just didn't want to because I was happy. I found something. (laughs) So we get out on this Schaefer Canyon Rim Drive. And as we're driving, I have, I have, an, have had an aversion to heights over the years. I, I'm not good with heights. I, I do remember the kids going to Blowing Rock one time and me crawling out on the, on the observation deck to come get them and bring them in because I couldn't actually walk out because I was deathly afraid. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So we get out here on this drive. The drive is a one lane dirt road. To give some background, Canyon Lands used to be a uranium mine. Uh, so they would go in, they'd dig uranium out and they'd drive it down to the refinery. The refinery is down at the end of this Schaefer Canyon rim drive. After taking the drive, a really uranium just, mine? Uranium mine, yes. Uranium. Fun for the whole family. Fun for the whole family. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were yeah. We were lured in by the fun for the whole family. But this <laughs> this road is actually a one lane dirt road that descends a fifteen hundred foot sheer canyon wall. There is no guardrail on the side. I, I used no guardrail instead of guardrails because I want to emphasize there's not a single guardrail on this drive anywhere. <laughs> and so we have one lane going down this sheer cliff side. The turns by this, the switchbacks are so tight to make my giant truck fit down them. I would have to go into the turn. And as my wheels begin to fall off of the side of the ca- off the side of the cliff, I'd have to back up a little bit to get some extra room to finish the turn. <laughs> And so we did this for like, oh my goodness. I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes. D is just losing her mind. Bella's videoing out of my window. Bjorn's playing video games while he's trying to totally dissociate from the event. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we, we get to the bottom and there's just this sense of elation because we're like, oh, we made it. We didn't make it. That was just like the first of many things that you should not survive on this drive. There were spots where there was us and another Toyota Tundra coming this way. And there was just enough room for, we could have slid a credit card between our mirrors and held it in place as we're like driving past. We have the Colorado river 300 feet below us. They have a cliff beside them. So it was just, it was just a textbook thing of like, don't do this dumb thing when you haven't planned it out whatsoever. 
I think the most fun of the whole event, though, was seeing the family cars driving by in the opposite direction as we got closer to Moab and all the bad stuff was out of the way. And I'm thinking, you guys have no idea what you're about to go through. <laughs> Man. All that right. was definitely so, a favorite. I don't even know where to start with that. Like, I mean, what... Aside from just the drive itself, what was there on the drive that made it fun for the whole family? Aside from, oh, you know, it? just trying to survive. What's funny is that if there actually was a lot going on. So, for example, you remember the movie Thelma and Louise? Yeah. Okay, the scene where they drive off into the Grand Canyon? They didn't drive off in the Grand Canyon. They drove yeah. off of this road. So, there's the Thelma and Louise jump-off <laughs> point. So, you get to see that. That's kind of cool. Um, there's dinosaur fossils and, and just old fossils, like all buried in the, the walls of the cab. You, as you're driving past, you see these giant, giant, you know, cliff faces. They're all covered in, in fossils, old, like layers of straighted dirt. I, as a, as a geology buff, as a history buff, it's really neat to be able to kind of see these things. The, the, the most mind numbingly striking feature though, of the whole drive. Near the end of the drive, you get to where they have there, – there's, there's, there are potash uh, evaporation pools. And it's, it's really startling because you're driving through all this, like, red rock, red rock everywhere. You come onto this facility where there's just the bluest water. I mean, just unbelievably blue. I would invite you to go look at some pictures of this stuff because it's just like – I actually didn't take any pictures of so, like – sucked into it's like well what is this doing out here because there's just these giant hmm. crystal clear pools of like i said just the bluest blue water you could possibly imagine so it middle was really utah. neat to middle of utah it's it's un, utah i will say this has some of the most incredible natural beauty available in the 50 states i mean it was just it was it was sad to leave because between there uh Bryce Canyon. I didn't care much for Zion, weirdly, but I, everything else there was just really incredible. So, yeah, just being able to see those kind of natural, natural things. Like went to um, Joshua. Everybody needs to go to Joshua Tree. That's a everybody needs to fit a Joshua Tree National Park trip in just for the, just for the 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 unique feeling of the place. As you're looking back over, I feel like I'm watching like every western I've ever seen in my entire life, like in still life, right oh, wow. in front of me. So. Really great ad- right. adventure. I'm, I'm going to call you next time we plan a big family vacation, I think. Or I'll just reference this podcast. I am absolutely happy to to offer any advice, any anything. It's it's so like, or we should just all hook up together and have like a big family trip. We, we can do that too. That sounds I like a good should. time. So we, but, uh, uh, yeah. Like the only family drive we've ever done is we got invited to go to uh, to Maui with some friends of ours um, about uh, a couple of years ago. They were going out there for for a big anniversary, and uh, mm-hmm. and we and we booked the trip, and then they had to cancel the last minute. But we couldn't cancel our plans because uh, they wouldn't give us our money back on our reservation. But they had booked their whole thing with points, so we went without them, and it was their idea in the first place. Nice and. Uh, but while we were out there, I, I heard in, in Maui, one of the big things to do was something called the road to Hana. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we rented a Jeep and we actually, and you drive like the back part of the island and it's like driving through Jurassic Park, but, and you're, you're just winding around the sides of these, the sides of these, uh, these cliffs and mountains. And there are, I want to say, there, I want to say there's like 52 one lane bridges where you have to stop and wait for people on the other side to come around. And, uh, and it, I mean, it was gorgeous. It was a really fun drive. If you like driving stuff like that, which, which yeah. I love doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was beautiful. It was incredible. It, that's, that's the first thing that popped in my head when you started talking about that, uh, about that journey. And, and it's really similar. I mean, we, we had so many, so many drives like that. Like they, that's one of many. So we go, we we're also avid rock collectors and miners. So we were staying in Anamas, New Mexico, really? small town. Yeah, oh yeah, I love doing it. 
Animos is a really small town in New Mexico. There's about 250 people. They, they still have a real general, like when I say they have a general store, they literally have a general store, like old school general store where there's a, 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 a catalog on the counter. You go and order the things you'd like, like that kind of general, general store. It's how oh, small wow. this place is. So we're asking the guy who runs the campground there. It's called Smuggler's Roost. It actually, the reason why it's called Smuggler's Roost is because I don't know if you remember the movie Tombstone, Curly Bill Brocious, the, the main antagonist of that movie, his hideout yeah. was in Animus, New Mexico. It's right in the uh, Chiricahua Mountains. And so this was like all, all those guys, you know, Curly Bill Brocious, Johnny Ring, all of all of the, the, the cowboys gang at that time, this was their hideout. So we get there. The guy who runs it is a Florida State grad named Gene. Um, we talked football for a little bit. I mostly just kind of laughed at how our fortunes have reversed up until this last year, and I haven't talked to him since, you know, I haven't talked to him since the game last year, and I don't plan on it until we win again. So, But, uh, yeah, so we get down there, and we're asking Gene, we're like, hey, you know, where can we go for mining and rocks? And he points to two places. He points us to the – there's a there's an old mine there in town called Old Hachita. Old Hachita used to produce turquoise just by gobs, and so we went out there. Well, the road out to this ghost town was really not a road to begin with. I mean, it, I, I off roaded all the way there. We finally had to stop because the road into the town had collapsed, and there was like a five foot gully that you just, I, I was not going to be able to get the truck through it. So we walked the rest of the way and went out and just, yeah, just to see the kind of, it was really interesting. Cause like, first of all, as, as you know, you're looking at it from a modern perspective, like, okay, why is this town five miles out into this field? So there's that mystery, but it was, it was an old copper mine. They would go out there and just mine copper. And then when the mines were done, they left. And so there's all these, and this is a very common situation. And, and the, the, West. So when you find it's not uncommon to find an old town or an old mining camp in the middle of nowhere and just all the mine stuff is still left there. So we went and checked it out, found little chunks of turquoise. It was pretty cool. And then we went to another place outside of Safford, Arizona. It was right there on the border. It was a uh, in Washington, we collect a lot of agates. Uh, it's very common to have them on the beach. They, it takes a little bit of skill to find them. But they're just you know shiny. They're agate. Uh, it's basically a, a variation of chalcedony. But you know you can see through it, some of them. Some of you can't. In particular, there's there's fire agate, which has uh, significant levels of, of impurities in it that causes the stone to stain brownish. And then when you look through it, it's like this really clear stone, but brown. And so when you find them here, it's a treat because it, it's it's rare. <laughs> so we're at this this rock hounding spot where they were so common after we'd collected 50 pounds of them in a rubber made. We're just like, I just don't care to find, I don't think we've been to agates ever since. We just got so many. We're like, who cares? We have 50 pounds of them, whatever. Goodness gracious. All right. So we've heard a lot about the, the round trip stories. We've heard a whole lot about the food and I'm still hungry because of that. But Sorry. um I got to ask, how did you do all this while working remote as a software? So that's a really good question. The first two years of doing these trips, it was just, it was really stressful. I, I can remember so many times there, there's a lot of pieces to these trips. I mean, it's not just like, you know, you have to plan out where you're staying. There were numerous times where we wouldn't have a campground picked out until like the day we were leaving. So we're leaving one campground and these like, where are we going next? Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. So, so there, we there's an all... old RV and we, and okay. I've, I've shared a little bit of this experience myself just because, you know, we would plan trips and we would just kind of hop from place to place. Sometimes mm -hmm. you plan in advance, you know where your big stops were, but you might have to improvise, but yes, uh, internet connections at different spots were always a challenge. Yeah. And that's, that was really true for the first two years we've done this 2021 and 2022 were terrible. I mean, I, I was constantly had to figure out where can I tether off my phone? You know, where can I, yeah. Are there places where I can go to the, yeah, we, we can't with thousand trails. And so they always have these clubhouses and it's fine. Like I don't mind working in clubhouse sometimes, 
especially in some of the campgrounds, like Arley, Alabama in particular has a really empty thousand trails that actually has a really nice clubhouse. So I had no problem with going to work in the clubhouse. Typically though, in the clubhouse, you have some guy that, that you're not really sure how long he's been there because the, the sweat stains in the chairs have kind of conformed to his body <laughs> and the Xbox <laughs> controller looks like it hasn't left his hand. And you're just like, I, I don't really know if I want to hang out with you and work for eight hours. So there's, yeah, it's, it's hit or miss. It's always hit or miss. Um, oh. Up until this past year. And it was really neat. So we got Starlink in, I guess, March before we left on our trip this year. Because it had just really, they had just really released their RV package and made it a big deal. My son is doing this full-time, full-time. So he's always on the road. And so we both bought Starlink, so little matching satellites. And, uh. Yeah, it was amazing at how that opened up being able to work on the road because there was no fear. I didn't have to worry about, oh, I'm not going to have any service. I, I can't tell you the number of times like in 2021 and, and, you know, 2022, I'd be having meetings. Like I was, I was working as a, I was the president of engineering for a company and I'm on this road trip and having meetings and I'm like, I can't talk to any of you because my connection is garbage because I'm in the middle of a valley here in Arizona. I don't know what you're saying. You don't know what I'm saying. So, yeah, that was a really stressful thing. Starlink has really, and I'm not, I, I know this sounds like an, a commercial for Starlink. It, it's, it's, I really don't intend it to be a commercial for Starlink. You're good. But it, it was amazing at the difference in terms of stress level that that took off because there's no figuring out if I have connection. I walk outside and stick the satellite up and boom, I'm connected. That was, well, that was I can a tell you a little bit, you know, for anybody who's listening, I can give you a little bit about what life before Starlink looked like, because, you know, whenever I, we hoped to be able to do this, whenever we got the RV, we, then we took a bunch of RV trips, but for the most part, uh, getting to work while on the RV trip was, was tougher because of everything you described. And so what I eventually started doing was, you know, you try to book an RV spot that's closer to wherever the clubhouse is at the park that you go to because maybe their Wi Fi yep. you can connect to it from in your R V. And eventually yep. I ended up paying like four hundred dollars to get a, a fancy Wi Fi antenna put on the R V so that I could connect to the Wi Fi signals that were like a, that were much farther away than I should yep. have been able to connect to. Um and and even then after doing all that it still wasn't great. Um, no. but, uh, so whenever Starlink started coming out, as soon as I saw the RV package come out, I'm like, God, I wish we still had the RV. I could totally do this. now. <laughs> I'm telling you no time like the present. It's, it's, it's amazing at how different it is. Like, I mean, we sat down one night in Arizona. We're, we're huge vintage movie buffs. So we love watching old movies. We're sitting there trying to watch the thin man one night. And the thing, man, is only an hour and 40 minutes, but it took us three hours to watch it because it would like buffer. <laughs> and this was, this is actually using the campgrounds Wi Fi is what made it even worse. Like I bought mm. a $15 package for a week of internet and it was, I, I, I could almost have gotten better signal by using a carrier pigeon. It was just terrible. It was awful. And then so, yeah, it's it's really a different world now that you have that ability to just kind of hook up and go. Like I, I would before that would be a real stress point, and I would talk to you about it. I'm like this is so stressful having like figure out just how I can even work. And now I just turn on the satellite and I sit down. And, you know, I plop down the dinette. I usually try to maintain because I live on the West Coast, and you know I have almost always worked for even before I worked for simply binary, I've worked at East coast firms. And so it's just kind of like a force of yeah. habit to stay on East coast time. And so in the trailer, that's the only other real opposition is that at six o'clock in the morning, I'm getting up to work, but we have 160 square feet of living space and everyone hears me getting up to go to work. And so, you know, trying to figure out how to, not invade everyone else's space while you're working is huge. And so that's, that's probably, you know, the things I would say are, if you're going to do a long road trip, get a big trailer. Don't, you know, we have a 20 foot trailer that we make work, but we, we make it work. It's not a, it's not an easy 
process. So there's definitely that. that makes um, I, I, you know, and I always felt like I would probably need a bigger monitor, but I found like even work on the road, I guess for some reason, because you are stripped down quite a bit anyway, work on the road. I find I don't even require any of my monitors or anything. I actually just carry my laptop and it's more than enough. And that was kind of a shocker at first. I'm used to having like big screen. Let me see everything I'm doing. And then it's just like when you're on the road, like you don't have room for a 32 inch monitor. You have room for your laptop and that's it. So it's, it's, it's not once you figure out the, the challenges of connection, fitting in time, Travel days are hard too. We tried to always make sure that our travels end up being on like either Saturday or Sunday so that we're not yeah. on the road in the middle of a work day. I can do that because I've got OnStar on my truck. So actually like when we're driving somewhere and I have to work, D will drive while I sit and do my thing. But it's, it's definitely easier if you can keep your travels to weekends. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can definitely attest to that. We always tried to do the pretty much the same thing. You, you yeah. either tra- travel on the weekends or you traveled in the evening. Um, yes. Evening so is not bad either. Know, like after the work day was over. You do have to be careful on the weekend, just especially then, you know, I, I'm sure this is the same anywhere, but our campgrounds over here on the West Coast are typically kind of overgrown. I mean, I've had some nightmare stories. My my son, when he first wanted to, to do the on-the-road living, he calls me and he's like, hey, do you mind coming with us to our first campground? The first campground was in a town called Ana Cortez. Or no, it's in La Conner. It's about 50 miles south of here. It's right on the ocean. It's a port town, basically. You get there at mm-hmm. 9 o'clock at night. It's pitch black. And... Yeah, you know, there's no assigned spots or anything with thousand trails. You just pick where you're gonna spot or you you pick where you're gonna go. And somehow Brody got his he's got a giant he's got his home office in his van and then a trailer that he pulls behind it. So I mean he's really got a nice setup. But he managed to get this nice setup on a one way road going up into a loop of their residential cabins at night in the rain and he could not get it back down. So I had to back his van and trailer. He had already driven well over a quarter of a mile up this road. I had to back it the full quarter of a mile back down pouring rain. So that would be my, my maybe don't leave at night if you can avoid it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. See, we were never towing anything. We, we had a, we bought a really like a 20 year old class a RV where you're just driving oh. the RV and you're not pulling anything. And yeah, uh, that might, that, that was, that's got its like own a, challenge. It, it was the greatest purchase of all time. I, mean, I think we paid $15,000 for this 20 year old RV. And, uh, and we, we spent maybe two or $3,000 completely like just gutting it. And we found a guy in Pickens mm-hmm. who would rip out the inter- nice. interior, put like bamboo floors on it and stuff. And, and we got a couple of new oh, chairs. Oh, nice. Back. And and it was great. And honestly, we at some point we eventually sold it after a couple of years. But we did our big family road, our first big family road trip, best vacation we've ever had as a family. Did like Maine and Niagara oh, nice. Falls and kind of up around the northeast area and stuff. And, we really uh, want to do that trip. It was great. And we um, and eventually we sold it. And you know, in our minds, we were we were upgrading to a to a nicer. RV. So we got another used RV that was about five or six years old, but it was a nicer model, had more features on it and everything. Mm-hmm. And I swear that thing was just in the shop all the time because it had more features, but every feature was something that could break. And yeah. they all broke. And it, you yeah. spent more time getting it worked on than you did spending time in it. And all we thought the entire time was, you know, I, I like the the cool slide out bunk beds that this thing has, but I missed the old RV. Yeah. <laughs> We, we should have just I'm telling you, on the gas in the old RV and been done with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, this is the problem with technology is that every new thing brings up one more thing that's going to break. I mean, that's you know, yeah. my my you didn't son need any of it. No, you need you need no, you need I mean, much, but they don't need to be automatic like theirs. Nah, man, you could. I, I've done some fabulous leveling jobs with with a tire iron and a few well placed four letter words as it's pouring rain on me. So <laughs> it can be done. 
<laughs> well, they make those those nice uh, those like uh, those orange like Lego brick looking things that you can make into a thing that you drive up on, and and it makes it no. real easy. To, if if you've got a little bit of an imbalanced area, you just make those little pyramid to whatever height you think it needs to be at, and then you just drive up on it, and you're basically there at level right when you pull up onto everything, and it makes it so easy to do because uh, you only need to do I it for like one that. tire typically to balance stuff out. And I hear easy, and I hear, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I just had this no, propensity, like, yeah, it's, it's just like I just have to, I, I, I did I put the effort into it? You know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. why, but. All right. I, yeah, I feel let's... like I'm going to have to change the setup. We're going, to, we're going down a long pathway with the camp and stuff, and there's definitely other Go stuff for I it. to cover before we, before we run out of our hour worth of time or so. Keep here. going, man. Uh, so. Two, so there's two more things I want to talk about, definitely, that I know we, we mentioned Absolutely. ahead of time. Number one, when you introduced yourself, you mentioned uh, that you were into apologetics. So tell me about that. Yes. So, you know, when when we left Clemson, I was, was definitely at a place where I had, had kind of decided I had outgrown Christianity. Um I felt like I was, was past that at that point, you know, and lots of other people bought into it, but I was smarter than that. And, you know, I had some nagging doubts about my own viewpoints, but I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Well, you know, I, I felt called back by, by God back into what I was, you know, trying to avoid. And, and, you know, I was like, okay, well, I, I'm going to buy into this, but man, this really scares me being a believer because I feel like I've got to be like, a, a, you know, an idiot to, to buy into this. I'm one of those guys now. And I was working at Sherwin Williams at the time and a, a buddy of mine, a guy worked for me. He said, you know, there's like entire fields of ministry that's entirely like around the concept of like harmonizing what we see in nature and what we see in science and what we see in scripture. I was really, well, I need to know what this is because I need not feel like I'm just like, winging it on, you know, pie in the sky, by and by. And so I bought my first apologetics book and I was absolutely hooked on it because it was like one of those things where it's like, I've always had a difficult time growing up in the, growing up, I grew up in a Methodist church and, you know, in the Methodist church, basically the unforgivable sin is nobody remembered to bring fried chicken to the potluck. If it's your job to bring the fried <laughs> chicken and you failed, you are going to hell. So, yeah, that was the closest I got to real that theology. I mean, everything. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. I, I had grown up with this weird perspective of religion where I'm like, you know, I figure if I'm just a good person, I should be all right. I, I'm i not Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm also not Billy Graham, but I'm definitely not Jeffrey Dahmer. And so I should be okay, right? Well, you know, over time, those walls kind of break down. We're like, yeah, no, that's not really how this works. And so I really got sucked into this. And I started thinking, you know, regardless of what you believe one way or the other, if we're talking about how we view our eternity, if we're talking, and you, you, you may be okay. I, I drop dead and I go push up daisies and that's it. Okay. That's cool. That's, that's your deal. But if I'm going to have a belief one way or the other, I mean, this is like serious stuff. This is eternity. This is not just like one thing. I'm going to research this to death to make sure I'm making the right choice. And I, I have to say it's been a real blessing to consistently go back to these things and research and research and research and, and just continuously see like, you know, I don't have to worry about where I'm putting my, my values. I know that they're solid. I know that it's real. And, and I know that not because of, yeah, you know, this feeling in me that, yeah, it's real. And I have to like, keep telling myself it's real. And now I'm going to see it's real when I die. Yeah. I'm actually able to sit there and feel like I'm not really worried about any new advances or new anything, because at the end of the day, this stuff is so solid, so concrete that I'd be a fool to worry about it. Yeah. It's great when, yeah. when my son is, is showing me something that he's discovered, something he's found on, you know, he's a big dinosaur buff like I am. And so when he's bringing up all these, these things, he's showing me all these things and, you know, he has questions about stuff. He's 10 year old brain. He's, he's, he's clued in. He's like, Hey dad, how, what do you think yeah. about, do you think the earth is really old? I'm like, 
yeah, I'm pretty darn sure it is, you know, and here's why I think this. And so we get to, to just kind of sit and go through things. And I, what I love is being able to tell him, never be afraid of a scientific finding. Never be afraid of it. It's not going to change your faith. You don't have to worry about it. It's, it's all good. So that really, that really pushed me in a lot of ways to, to really, you know, dig into that area of, of ministry and that area of our faith to the point where like, I, I really feel like every believer needs to be able to, to look at their faith and uh, maybe it's just the computer engineering in me. I don't know. Like maybe it's just you know, like, I just feel like there, there's a set of facts sitting there waiting for you to discover them and you operate by them mm-hmm. and don't worry. Yep. That's awesome, man. All right. Well, my last question for you. Um, do you have any investing advice? Investing advice. So, you know, one of the things like as being on the road, <laughs> like <laughs> back down the road, but, you know, being on the road, you do kind of like get a micro, like, yeah, you get a microcosm of the American perspective. Like you run into everybody. Yeah, being close to the border, you run into people from other countries, you run into like all these other perspectives. One of the biggest perspectives I have seen in the past few years is, you know, I don't want to say diversify your assets and I don't want to make it sound like I'm like a, a economics guru or anything. But, you know, my biggest advice would be, A, have your assets as diversified as possible. You know, pick some things that you feel like are strong runners and get into them. Like I said, for myself, I have money invested in a lot of blended stocks. I also have recently gotten into grabbing tangible things by tangible things. I, I, I am completely prepper on this gold and silver, precious metals. I have been a huge proponent of, of, of precious, you know, people that I've spoke to, you know, things that, come up where people have asked me questions as far as like, you know, at church, people are asking what I, well, what do you do with your money? I'm like, I'm buying precious metals now. There's, there's a reason. Uh, obviously they hold value. Um, as you know, being in the more prepper bend, I, I do invest more in silver because of how small silver is in terms of value You can get $20 of silver for an ounce versus $2,000 an ounce for gold. So yeah, you can quote, you can cover more gold in a smaller space, but sometimes the idea of something that small that I could possibly lose that's also worth $2,000 isn't as appealing. So I would definitely say, you know, find areas to invest in where you can have something that's tangible, that has value. I've been investing in football and baseball cards lately, not because I feel like it's where you need really? to go, but yeah. So I just started doing this thing where I'll buy like complete sets of a year of sports. So like I just got the 2023 set, you know, obviously are, you know, yeah, I'm sitting here with a box of the CJ Stroud rookie card. That's completely untouched. I am completely sure that box is going to be worth far more than the 70 bucks I spent to get the whole box, you know? So it, it's not a bad move. I would never, it, I would, I don't think I'd tell anyone invest all of your money in baseball and football cards. However, I would definitely <laughs> tell you to invest in things that are valuable that hold some level of value. I mean, even with precious metals, I mean, silver has a lot of value as an industrial conductor. The other thing with silver is the fact that since silver is normally consumed in the process of use, it is eventually going to increase in value just in terms of scarcity because the silver supply is actually oh, yeah. being used. Whereas gold is not used. Is not so all kind there's, there's all kind I would, I would suggest anyone who jumps into any kind of investment, always ask, what am I investing for? In my view, an investment is it's, it's a multifold there. There's a planning of what am I going to do when I'm old and fat and happy and am going to live my few years remaining. What am I going to do? Well, sign invest in stocks and things like that. What am I going to do if, if everything just, you know, if we hit one of those crap hits the fan scenarios, I can't spend my 401k at that point and I can't spend yeah. fiat currency at that point. But if I've got some gold and silver and, you know, a couple things like that, I have some value that's, that's actually tangible and can be traded. So Always, always look at, at the fact that you can't prepare for everything in life, but pick out some of the Did big high points. Collector? You know, I actually have some silver rounds coming, but I haven't. I, I, and obviously, you know, we've all kind of done like the, the habits and the hobbies. I've done it a little bit just in terms of like, 
I have collected coins. I think I have a, a, a quart bag around here somewhere that's got, it's, it's got a world book encyclopedia coin bank in it with about probably $10 worth of, of silver dollars. Some weird coins from across the world that I, I ordered from a free stuff for kids book one time and then like 40 or 50 Susan B. Anthony silver dollars. Why I don't know, but. Oh, good. Well, I mean, like I, I used to, my grandparents and stuff used to always give me silver dollars and coins over the years. And my, my grandfather on my mom's side, he used to, um, like he had collected for years and he would give me the stuff that he had collected or that, it, that his parents had given him. Nice. And he gave me a, he gave me a few coins from like the, the like 1890s and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and I never really knew what to do with any of these things as I was a kid. So of course I put them in a box. And then at some point, um, at some point after he, uh, after he passed away, I just kind of started going through all the stuff that he'd give me and everything. And I was mm-hmm. like, you know what? I'm going to actually analyze these, these coins that I have to see if they're valuable. And I didn't know what I was looking at or anything. And, and so I, I pull up one of these 1890s coins and I start like, you know, Googling it to, to try to look up value. And I'm, I remember getting into all these different coin sites and stuff. And, and I see this, this coin and I'm looking at the website and what it says it's worth. And I look back down to the coin. I'm looking at the website and it goes, this coin's worth $300,000. And I'm like, it, it's late at night. I, I just decided to do this late one night. And uh, it, I mean, it's like 1130 or something like that. And I'm sitting there going, we're rich. We're rich. And so I, I run into the other room and I wake up my wife and I'm like, honey, honey, you're not going to believe this. But uh, but one of these coins in the collections worth three hundred thousand dollars, and I and she's like, "There's there's no way." And so I, I she went back to sleep. I came back and, and kept looking at it, and then I, and I found out one thing I did not realize was that there's also like a, a, a minting location on the coin, and yeah. uh, and I didn't realize that at the time. And this this exact coin, if it had been minted in New Orleans would have been worth $300,000, but it was not minted in New Orleans. And I didn't know how to spot that yet. Still worth yeah. about $300, bucks, which is pretty cool. I, hey, but, nothing uh, wrong with that. But dang, yeah, I, 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 I panicked. That is but, great. Uh, anyway, look, we're, we are at time. And All right. so uh, I, I need to, to ask, is there anything you want to wrap up with? No, I'm good. I It's been a pleasure being on. I think it's the first time I've ever been on a podcast. So I hope I didn't say anything too embarrassing. <laughs> No, you're good. And, you know, as, as described, we uh, we can edit stuff if, if need be. So whenever the Excellent. audience hears those gaps, then they'll know exactly that they, they missed some good stories. But uh, look, thanks a lot for coming on and sharing your, uh, your experience and your stories. It's been a great time. It's been great catching up with you again, Don. So I'm going to give my, uh, my quick shout out every week to uh, thanks again for, to uh, Herd Media here in Greenville for uh, for helping me get this podcast off the ground in the first place. If you're ever looking to uh, to launch a podcast and want some assistance or you're looking to, to have a firm help you um, uh, by producing the entire thing uh, for you and you just kind of handle the recordings and they'll handle everything else. Check out uh, check out Herd Media and uh, links in the show notes. Thanks a lot. This has been the Carolina Codecast.